According to legend, St. Luke painted Mary's portrait. While there is no historical evidence to support this legend, we do have thousands of images of Mary created by artists throughout the centuries, giving us visual illuminations of the Mother of God, the Queen of Heaven, Our Lady of Perpetual Help, or simply the Virgin Mary. This presentation is the result of my research as an art historian, but also it is a personal journey as an artist and a novelist. We're going to examine Mary's images through four different lenses. First, the four dogmas of the Catholic Church. Second, key events in her life. Third, ethnic considerations, that is, showing Mary in a way that reflects artists' interests in various cultures. And fourth, exploration of the many types of materials or media used to depict Mary. The Four Dogmas, Perpetual Virginity, Mother of God, Immaculate Conception, and the Assumption. In the first dogma, the Catholic Church holds that Mary was a virgin before and after Christ's birth. There is no biblical basis for this belief, but it was thought that sex and marriage were symptoms of original sin. But how does an artist depict the concept of perpetual virginity? In the Eastern Orthodox Church, an icon known as the Ea Parthenos means ever virgin. Symbolically, Mary's perpetual virginity signifies a new creative start in the salvation history. Also known as the Virgin of Vladimir, this particular icon is culturally significant in Russian history. It was eventually moved to Moscow in 1395, and it is said to have saved Moscow from destruction several times. Theologian Henri Nguyen remarked that the Virgin's eyes glance at neither the child or the viewer, but appear to look inward and outward at once that her free hand gestures toward the baby to open a space for us to approach Jesus without fear, and that the child is shown as a wise man dressed in adult clothes. The three stars signify the Virgin's perpetual virginity, past, present, and future. Two stars are obvious, the third not so. As an artist, I tried to think, how could I depict this concept of perpetual virginity. I decide to focus on the Virgin Mary as an older woman in Gethsemane, like our Israelite guide many, many years ago, who's basking in the sun against the rocks in the garden. I certainly had to show the lilies as a symbol of the Virgin's virginity, but what else? What else could I clue the reader into or the viewer into this image? and I decided on the dove, the Holy Spirit, but compositionally, if it was flying or if it was anywhere in the picture, it seemed to me that it would take away emphasis from the Virgin. And so I decided that she had a pet dove in her lap, but symbolically that the Holy Spirit was always with her throughout her life. I wasn't intending to show this particular face but when I got done, I had to laugh because I said to myself, Aunt Vera, how did you get into my painting? The second dogma is Mary, Mother of God. Here we're seeing a painting by Fra Filippo Lippi. If we were in the UVC gallery now, strolling through the rooms, we first would see a beautiful Madonna, gold, stiff figures, frontal gaze, and if we continued to room eight, we would see this painting by Fra Filippo Lippi only 150 years later than the other painting. And how different, naturalistic, profile, even part of the a blocked view of the angel. It's not flat. It's very, very engaging. There are amazing details. There is the elaborate throne, the armrest, as you can see on the right. 
uh, the artist created a frame as if the Virgin is sitting next to the window and we look through the window to the landscape and the halo almost disappears. Look at the beautiful treatment of the hair and the veil. And there's an interesting story to this as well. Below you see the self-portrait of Filippo Lippi. He was orphaned and sent to a Carmelite monastery. He became a priest. 1432, he left the monastery, but not his vows. In 1458, he met a beautiful novice, Lucretia Buti, and asked that she be his model for the Virgin Mary. Now here the story gets murky. We don't know if Lucretia was abducted or if it was a great love affair, but the couple had a son named Filippino Lippi, who is also a great painter of the Florentine uh, period. Moving on, the third dogma, Immaculate Conception. The dogma of the Immaculate Conception states that the most blessed Virgin Mary, from the first moment of her conception, was kept free of every stain of original sin. Again, how can an art artist illustrate such a concept? For this, we can thank a Spaniard. His name is Francisco Pacheco, and he popularized emblems or symbols to convey this dogma. And he wrote about it in a book, Art of Painting. Plus, he was very influential. He was the father-in-law to the Spanish master, Diego Velazquez, director of an art school, and maybe even more important, official censor of the Spanish Inquisition. So what did he decide? He said to display or to communicate that idea of immaculate conception. A woman should be clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, stars, 12 stars, a dragon or a snake at her feet, sun behind her. Usually there are angels. Sometimes she's standing on a crescent moon. Here we see an example from the Spanish painter Murillo. To the left, a version by the Flemish artist Peter Paul Rubens, and on the right, a hand-carved wooden statue. They're known as Santos, and they're very popular in Hispanic American communities here in the United States, particularly New Mexico. We see the subject often in holy cards. At first, the holy cards were images from the masters. Then, with lithography and other printing methods, the images became popularized. And some might say the images are overly pious and sentimental. Another version in France in 1830, Catherine Labore saw a vision of Mary as the Immaculate Conception standing on a globe while a voice commanded her to have a medal made in imitation of what she saw. This medal, the popularity of it, spread throughout the world and it was really the beginning of the 19th century Marian revival. Finally, we come to the Assumption. This dogma was not proclaimed till November 1st, 1950. And first, an explanation. There is a distinction that needs to be made between an Ascension and Assumption. Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, a sign of divine power, Mary, on the contrary, was elevated or assumed into heaven by the power and grace of God. What we're seeing here is the Assumption window at Assumption Catholic Church in Chicago. The church was founded in 1881 in an area north of the Chicago River that had been settled by Italian immigrants. The care of this new parish was entrusted to the order of friar servants of Mary or Servites, a religious order founded in Italy in the 13th century devoted to the Virgin Mary. To the right, you see the Assumption window in the 1930s. Why was the church named Assumption? Well, the principal patroness of the order is Our Lady of Sorrows. 
but a parish with that name was already established in 1874 in Chicago. Therefore, Assumption was picked in 1881. Even though the dogma was not officially established till 1950, but the belief in the assumption was universal at that time in the 19th century. As for the windows itself, it was installed in 1906 from the Munich School of Stained Glass. It display, displays three realms, the earthly realm with the apostles surrounding Mary's empty tomb, the assumption of Mary, and finally the heavenly realm. The inspiration for this stained glass window came from Titian's Assumption of the Virgin Mary on the right. So that concludes our discussion of the dogma. But let's look at the Virgin Mary in a different way. Key events in her life. Many are not based in the Bible, but have come about from other sources. So we ask ourselves in this section, how were the events in Mary's life depicted? Do you think the artist was successful in telling the narrative or conveying a mood? And are you spiritually inspired by the piece, why or why not? We're going to begin with Giotto, the Arena Chapel, one of the few uh, series on the Virgin's life. This is the presentation of the Virgin in the Temple. Giotto did 26 scenes from the life of the Virgin in 1305 on fresco. So here we have a somewhat timid Mary who is posed between the protective arms of her mother Anne and the high priest. Notice how the architectural elements support and tell the story of this illustration. There are many examples of the Annunciation. I decided to show Henry Osawa Tanner's The Annunciation. He was the son of a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He specialized in religious subjects. And here the Virgin is shown without a halo or any of the usual symbols of the holy. And Gabriel is shown as a shaft of light. You can see in her face perhaps timidity, Reflection, thoughtfulness, wonder. This next image is going to take a little bit of an explanation. It's by Raphael, The Marriage of the Virgin. It was painted when Raphael was only 21 years old. Already he shows his mastery of perspective and his ability to convey an Italian Renaissance temple. The front and back doors of the temple are open so that you can see a little bit of the sfumato or the haze in the distance. This is a very unusual subject. Raphael could have been inspired by, uh, by the painting done by his teacher, per Perugino, done between 1500 to 1504. And here you see the two paintings together. Going back to Raphael's painting, he put his name on the temple itself. And we have some curious details. Joseph places a ring on the Virgin Mary's finger. Now, she is traditionally shown with a red uh, gown next to her body, signifying her humanity. And she wears an additional blue cloak meaning that she has taken on the heaven, the sky, and the sacredness. And you will see this over and over, these two color combinations. On the right, we see a boy breaking a twig with his knee while other boys stand behind him, um, holding their branches. And the story is, is that the high priest couldn't decide which suitor would be suitable for the Virgin Mary. And it was decided that the one whose stick bloomed would be her husband. So Joseph is the only suitor who is bearded and barefoot. And you can see to the right, I made a little circle where you can barely see a rose that is blooming from Joseph's stick. 
There are so many images that one could show for the nativity. And I decided to show this one. First of all, I needed a French painter, Georges de la Tour, L'Adoration uh, des Bergers, The Adoration of the Shepherds. It's a simple rendition. You don't have a cast of thousands here, but you have a brilliant light on the baby Jesus coming from a candlelight, and Mary's not this beautiful model of a a, a gorgeous woman. She She's a woman who looks like she has given birth to a child, tired, reflective, and the faces are so exquisite of these common people. Moving on to the presentation in the temple, here we have an English painter, John Opie. Again, the light is used so successfully, and it has significance. Simeon, recognizes the Christ child divinity and that this is the light that will illuminate the world. This painting served as a model for illustrations in a Bible. The secondary characters, especially the, uh, the man in the front, is that Joseph. Um, it's not a usual representation of Joseph as an older man. It's curious. Here we have the Holy Family with Angels by Rembrandt. This is a very unusual look of the Virgin Mary caring for her baby child. Uh, one might say a typical Dutch family in Amsterdam. She's checking on her baby. While Joseph is in the background making a yoke. And the biblical reference is, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you see a flurry of angels that are descending onto the scene. This image is probably not so well known. It's by Eliz Elisabetta Serrani. It's in the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Now, she was an Italian Baroque painter who died suddenly at the age of 27. But even at that young age, she had already produced over 200 paintings. She was the pioneering female artist in early uh, Bologna. She had established an, an academy for other women artists. And here we see the baby Jesus uh, playing with a, a crown of roses, uh, attempting to put the crown on Mary's head. This one, I must confess, is my least favorite in all the shows. It's like a cast of thousands. And yet, when I was going through all the different images, there really aren't that many images of the wedding feast of Cana. This is by far the most well-known one. It's in the Louvre by Veronese. But once I started to break it down, I became intrigued. This is the Virgin Mary in this cast of thousands. This was commissioned by Benedictine monks for their refractory. And you can see the, uh, the, the location of this painting here in Venice. You're also seeing uh, some of the famous people. For instance, uh, Titian is supposed to be the musician in the right. And Suleiman, the Magnificent, also happens to be at the table. You see a black servant in that left image offering a glass of the new wine to the bridegroom and bride who are not seated at the place of honor but to the far left because the place of honor goes to Jesus and the Virgin Mary. And here you see the whole painting once again. Of course, the next key event is the crucifixion, and there are so many images. But I decided to look at this one, the Eisenheim Altarpiece by Matthias Grunwald, German Renaissance painter. It was painted for the monastery of St. Anthony, where the monks took care of the sick. And here you see the Virgin Mary collapsing into the arms of St. John.
and I had to, of course, use Michelangelo's Pieta. Uh, the Pieta is an image of Mary holding the dead body of Jesus on her lap or in her arms. This is marble in St. Peter's Basilica, and Michelangelo sculpted this piece when he was only 24 years of age out of one block of marble. It reflects the high Renaissance ideals of balance and stability with this pyramid shape. There's also an idealistic beauty to the figures. Christ's skin is realistically depicted as having been bruised and pierced. Critics pointed out that the Virgin appeared to be too young to have a 33-year-old son. Michelangelo replied that women who are chaste retain their beauty longer than women who are not chaste. The other criticism, criticism is that the Virgin's body is too large for her small head, and yet Michelangelo needed a large body to support Christ's body. Therefore, he tried to fix things up by having voluminous cloaks and gowns. And finally we come to the Assumption of the Virgin Mary once again and I absolutely had to include El Greco's um, piece, magnificent piece, that's in the Art Institute of Chicago. This was his first major Spanish commission, his first large public work. Here the Virgin floats on a crescent moon, symbol of her purity, and the apostles gather around her empty tomb expressing astonishment. Now we turn to ethnic considerations and we have these following reflections and thoughts and questions. There has been criticism that many of our visualizations of Mary and Jesus are European centered and do not reflect all of God's people. But how important is it to see the divine in our own image? Does it matter that the artist is portraying holy ones not of his or her ethnic background? And can you relate to images of ethnic representations that aren't your own? And finally, overall, how can we increase contemporary religious patronage? The Navajo Madonna by Robert Lentz. He is known for icons that celebrate the beauty of contemporary uh, social themes. This is um, a, a particular one that's showing the beauty of the Navajo culture. I won't make a lot of comments on these. The idea is, is that you can just enjoy the images and come to your own thoughts. This is the Hopi Virgin and Child by Father John Giuliani. His intent is to depict Christian saints as Native Americans to honor them and to acknowledge their original spiritual presence on this land. Here we have a work by Wata, Watanabe, a Japanese printmaker famous for biblical prints. Uh, in this one, Mary visits Elizabeth. He said, I would most like to see my prints hanging where people ordinarily gather because Jesus brought the gospel for the people. Certainly we must include the many, many images of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Five Marian apparitions in December 1531 and the venerated image on a cloak enshrined within the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. And here we have our Lady of Cocharcas, the name of a town in Peru. This is an example of the Cusco, Cusco School of Painting in the 1700s. The pyramid-shaped cloak evokes the Peruvian mountains, rich and detailed, flattened shapes, and elaborate canopy that you might even see uh, even today with uh, the townspeople celebrating the different festivals of their villages. This is an Ethiopian diptych 
it's actually a pendant that people wore. Um, this one uh, is attached by cords around the neck. There are black outline figures on neutral backgrounds. Um, the seated Virgin Mary has a close relati relationship with St. George. This is Janet McKenzie's work entitled The Divine Journey, Command Companions of Love and Hope. It's in the collection of the Memorial Church, Harvard University. She says of her work, it's a, a Mary is a beloved foundational figure around which timeless women gather. The images that I've shown you, a lot of them have been uh, as a result of patronage or uh, part of the hierarchy of the church, but there's another movement that was going on at the same time. We don't know who created all these black virgins. There's currently about 400 to 500, um, mostly statues, uh, not always, sometimes paintings. They were usually not commissioned by the church. They were found in places of nature. Um, were they originally black or did they turn black over time? Uh, they were often associated with miracles and they were examples of popular piety. Years ago, I saw the Black Madonna at Rocamadour, France, and I was so impressed with it that years later I wrote a novel with three narratives going backward in time uh, with uh, one statue of the Black Virgin it is uh, key to all the, 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 the three stories. And in France is the story of the woman who actually created this Black Madonna. So as a, both as an artist and writer, when one wants to express something related in this issue, it, it isn't just having that desire, it's trying to figure out the format that would work to communicate one's ideas. In this case, it took me about 12 years to figure out the links between the women and their association with uh, the Black Madonna. And of course, we have the Black Madonna of Chenstuhova. Um, this is an Eastern Orthodox style icon. Uh, it's the one who points the way. She gestures toward the Christ child as the source of salvation. And this image has been associated with Poland for 600 years. Now finally we look at materials. How does an artist's choice of medium inform your ideas about Mary? Uh, for the most part, my comments will be very brief and will be going backward in time. The first one I'm going to show is Stained Glass by Scott Parsons. Uh, this was uh, the Mysteries of the Rosary for our Lady of Loretto in Foxfield, Colorado. The Virgin Mary can be seen in the center of the window and the bright light at the top represents the Holy Spirit coming down upon Mary. The flower, the white one, represents Mary, the red one, Elizabeth. This is a work by Chris Anderson, Red Madonna and Child, Oil on Acrylic, Red Oxide on Panel. Dan Palos of Albuquerque, New Mexico, a serigraph on the left. Uh, it's called Mary's Final Embrace, 2017. He decided to use red for the crucified Christ um, as Christ's spilled blood saved us. And on the right is the first of his 150 paper cuttings, this one called Lady of Light, and his only instrument, a pair of scissors. We come to this uh, work called The Holy Virgin Mary, 1996, Mixed Media, by Christopher Ophili. This work includes oil paint, glitter, polyester resin, elephant dun, map pins, and collaged pornographic images. 
The painting was sold to the hedge fund investor Steve Cohen for $4.6 million in June 2015 and donated to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. In 1999, the work was shown at the Brooklyn Museum. Then Mayor Rudy Giuliani said the idea of having so-called works of art in which people are throwing elephant dung at a picture of the Virgin Mary is sick. Ophelia, raised as a Roman Catholic, commented that elephant dung in itself is quite a beautiful object. From the Museum of Modern Art website, quote, close inspection reveals the delicate fluttering cherubim surrounding her to be crafted from images of women's buttocks clipped from pornographic magazines. The introduction of eroticism to the Christian Virgin's sacred image is far from new. Quote, when I go to the National Gallery and see paintings of the Virgin Mary, I see how sexually charged they are, the artist said. Mine is simply a hip-hop version. From there we go to etchings. Um, this one is the Annunciation 1990 by Joan Bolig from Egan, Minnesota. Uh, she very successfully includes biblical verse with her etchings and in this piece each flower has a particular symbolism. Charcoal Drawings by Deidre Ludwig, um, 1945 to 2018. Um, she uh, did all her work in charcoal. And this is Two Marys at the Tomb from the biblical verse, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Was this Mary Virgin, uh, Mother Mary? We don't know. Um, this is the only charcoal drawing that Deidre did um, of this particular theme. Moving backward in time, Virginia Broderick, 1917 to 2004. Um, she had a major influence on post-Vatican II illustrations. She contributed to the Leaflet Missile Company. And her work um, would be very familiar to Catholics uh, and the church bulletin uh, because in fact a lot of the church bulletins still look very much um, like her work. Crystal Glass. This was done by Bjorn Windblad, uh, a Danish painter, designer. This was a nativity scene and this is um, the Virgin Mary and the Child from that um, seven piece nativity collection. Many popular mass-produced images of Marian apparitions. Uh, how do you identify them? Well, if there's three children, it's Our Lady of Fatima, a single girl in a grotto, Our Lady of Lourdes, and finally Our Lady of Medjugorje Georgie appeared um, to six seers in 1981. Um, those uh, young people are not shown in common illustrations, only uh, their description of of who they saw, which was a beautiful young woman floating on a cloud. You may be familiar with the work of Corita Kent, a pop artist. Um, the, her poster there on, le on the left is very familiar. But she also did a screen print of the Annunciation, a little hard to decipher. So I have an arrow pointing out where the face of the angel is. And of course, the blue represents the Virgin Mary. Next we have a work, um, very intriguing, Madonna and Child by Marianne Stokes, who uh, was from Austria. She married an Englishman, moved to England. Uh, this is in Tempera. Uh, this woman was considered one of the leading uh, female artists in the Victorian era. And this particular image, it is thought that she was inspired by some of the people that she saw when visiting Croatia. Next we have a stone figure by Barbara Hepworth, famous sculptress, Madonna and Child in St. Ives Parish Church in Cornwall, England. This was carved in the memory of her son Paul, who died in an RAF plane crash over Thailand in 1953.
And then we have Kette Kolwitz, German. Here in this woodcut, we have Mary greeting Elizabeth, who feels the child in Mary's womb. And taking a big leap backwards, we have Terracotta, Luca della Robbia. Here that Jesus reaches for a white lily, a symbol of Mary's purity. The tapestry takes a little bit of an explanation. <clears throat> an angel startles the Virgin Mary as she reads a book, possibly foretelling the birth of the Savior. The garden suggests a much older garden, the Garden of Eden, but in, instead of exile, we have the Garden of Salvation with the new Eve. Jesus is sent on a cross, line one, and there's a single white lily symbolizing the virginity's purity, line two. Another stone figure, which is almost in all of the textbooks on history of art. This is the Virgin of Paris at Notre Dame Cathedral. It was not damaged in the fire. Uh, the reason why this is important is because it shows the separation of the sculpture from its architectural base. And there's a graceful S movement of the figure, not stationary like um, many of the earlier statues. She holds the Christ child, who in turn is holding an orb of the world, a reference to his mission as savior of the world. And here we have a small elephant ivory. Um, it was, it's heavily damaged, but you can see a little bit about the feet of the Christ child climbing up on the Virgin's lap. Um, there's a tender connection between the child and the Virgin. And the ivory has a rich um, covering, the stain of walnut oil. And finally, what we think is the earliest known image of the Virgin Mary, a fresco, 150 AD in the catacomb, nursing the infant Jesus. But even the earliest artists, like all the artists throughout the centuries, still had the same problem. How do you show the Virgin Mary and in what way? Thank you so much. I welcome your comments. Um, and I uh, hope that you have enjoyed the many images of the Virgin Mary throughout the ages.